Thank you for coming. So this talk is going to be about static control flow in C++14. And I have no slides. So this is what you're going to see for one hour and 30 minutes, just code and comments. So I hope you're ready for that. Uh, you can find everything on this GitHub repository here, if I can manage to select it correctly, OK. And every single code segment you see on the left can be compiled and contains comments. So you can also read them if you want later. Let's see what, what we're going to talk about. So the first part of the talk will be regarding uh, branching at compile time. We'll talk about static branching. We'll talk about this context if proposal. And we'll implement a static if in C14 and show some usage ex examples. Then we'll pass on to iteration at compile time. We'll explore the for each argument code snippet, which should be famous or for most of you, is, was made for, uh, by Sean Parent. And unfortunately, while it is good, it has some limitations. So what we'll do, it will, we will implement a new iteration construct at compile time, which I call static4. And we'll see some examples and its implementation. Afterward, we'll look at some possible overhead by comparing assembly. And then we'll look at some available production-ready solutions that you can use in your projects. So static is a specifier with multiple meanings in C++, but it's also a word that's very commonly used by developers to refer to compile time uh, control flow. I'm sure you've all out about static if, which is a name given to the compile time counterpart of the normal if statement. And this inclusion has been proposed multiple times into C++. Unfortunately, most of the proposals have been quite controversial, and we'll analyze them later. But some languages uh, do have static if constructs in them. An example of such a language is D. This is a D code snippet, where we define a template called int that takes a parameter at compile time. And here, with static if, we branch at compile time, and we define an alias that depends on the uh, i parameter. As you can see, this is quite strange, because we are not introducing any new scope, as int is defined in both branches of the static if. So this is an implementation in the D language that does not s follow the common scope rules. Obviously, to achieve the same result in C++, the most intuitive thing to do would be use specialization here. And we can just specialize on the compile time value and define an alias depending on the value. Static if is not only useful when we define type aliases, but I think it's very convenient and superior to specialization when we need to have small pieces of code change depending on our compile time condition. So it's very useful when we want locality and we want to reason about code uh, that's very small in scope. Here's uh, an example of handling a parameter pack here. We do have a laser pointer. So usually what you do is you define a function that takes a single parameter, and then a function that handles the whole parameter pack. You call the first one to handle one t element, and then you recurse calling the tail. This is a fine, but you have to define the function twice. I'd argue that the static if version is much easier to read and reason about, as it's all, all Everything in, is in the same function, and you can immediately see what's going on without having to jump to the other specialization. This is just an example. And I have another example regarding the construction syntax of objects. So let's say we're building a make unique function here, and we want to support both brace initialization syntax and the normal syntax that does implicit conversions. And what we can do is use an enable if t here to check if it's actually constructible with these arguments. And here we have to negate the predicate. And you can see we have a lot of code repetition. We have annoying enable if code here, which is pretty ugly. And I don't really like to maintain this kind of code. <coughs> with static if, it's, it is a lot simple, simpler. We have no kind of enable if in here. We can just branch on a compact time condition and return uh, the, the correct branch depending on whether or not the t parameter is constructible using brace syntax. So the above examples were not written by me. They're actually part of a C17 proposal for the inclusion of a static if-like construct that we're going to analyze in, a, in the next code segment. Also, please feel, feel free to interrupt me at any time and ask questions, as many of the examples can have little interesting things. Sure. <coughs> 
did the static if get into 17? Or? Uh, I think it's very likely, likely to make it into 17. The name is not static if, it's constructs brief. And we'll take a look at it right now. So the previous examples were taken from this proposal here that is called static if resurrected. And it is a complete rewrite of a very controversial proposal that was called static if considered. It was controversial because it didn't have the normal scope rules as you would expect from a runtime ifs branch. It was similar to the D static if, and it really didn't fit in with the rest of the C++ language. Uh, that proposal for static if was recently revised in this other paper here, changing the name static if to constructs brief, and clearly specifying the restriction of the construct. This is an example of the syntax that's proposed in the new newest paper. As you can see, it's constructs brief. We also have a constructs else, and Sure, a question. Uh, is it uh, an error or is it, uh, why is there an underscore between cons extra else and none between cons extra if? Okay, the question was, why, why is there an underscore here and not here? And this is taken directly from the paper, so this was one of the proposed syntaxes. I have another example of a revision of the paper where the syntax is slightly different. Okay, so this is directly from the paper. Anyway, it is practically identical to the previous example, just static if is called constructs with, and else has to be marked as constructs as well. So the, the proposal has to follow these rules. We, also, we always are restricted to block scopes, so it's like a regular runtime if, and we are always going to establish a new scope, and it is required that there exist values of the condition so that either condition branch is well formed. So this condition has to be either true or false, and both condition branches have to be well formed, depending on the value of the condition. So the above rules deal with the controversial ideas of the previous paper, and as we've seen, it's very, very likely that the proposal will make it to C++ 17. There are some additional changes and revisions, but it's mostly bike shedding over the syntax. This is another uh, revision where the syntax is as follows. We have if, constructs, and the condition, else if, constructs, and the condition. So in this syntax, we kind of bind constructs to the condition. Uh, I'm not sure which one is going to make it into C++ 17, but it's very likely that we'll have a constructs with statement in one way or another. So if you don't want to wait for C++ 17, we, we can actually implement our own static if using C++ 14 language features that's pretty easy to use. Unfortunately, the syntax is not as clean as the constructs is one, but it's still superior to specialization in some uh, occasions, in my opinion. Sure question. You said that the statements had to be well formed. Yeah. So. statement two was like really expensive compile time. Would it be reflected if it So the question is, since the statements have to be well formed, what if, uh, like this condition was true, and this is the correct branch, but do we still have to, like, uh, have to parse the statement, the statement to even if it's expensive at compile time? So as far as I know, every single statement has to be parsable. Every single branch of the constructs brief has to be parsable. Louis? Um, well, you know, I don't know the details about the proposal, but <coughs> I would actually expect that only the branch that is chosen by the condition has to actually compile. It probably has to be parsable, but yeah. Semantic analysis was probably not performed, right? Yeah. So the comment was that the only the only branch that has to be instantiated and is the only branch that matches the condition. The other branches have to be parsable, but not instantiated. Right. That's right. And yeah, I think that's the re that's the way it works. It also works like that in my implementation of static if. So that's very likely. Does that does that answer your question? So so you could use it for like a lazy. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. As long as it is valid C++, as long as it is parsable, you can use it. It will be instantiated only if the condition is true, and that's the power of static if. So before diving into the implementation of static if, let's take a look at a very simple example. Here we have some structs that represent some kind of foods with different interfaces. We have banana and peanuts that have the eat method. We have water and juice that have the drink method. And we'd like to create a generic consume function that takes any kind of food and either calls eat or drink depending on the interface of the food. Uh, to do that, I'll first use C++14 template variables to specialize some booleans in order to categorize the types into two, into two separate categories. So solid types will 
will be, will be true for banana and peanuts, and liquid types will be true for water and juice. This is just a C++14 variable template specialization. Now I'll define my consume function, and this is where you'll see the first example of static if syntax. So in static if, I have to pass here a compile time boolean predicate that I wrapped into a boolean bool v context variable. And then I can chain some operations here, some methods, uh, to create the branching of the static if. So the first thing I do is use dot then and pass a callable object in here. Then I do else if with another compile time condition. And I can keep chaining these statements over and over. One thing to notice is that every branch contains a callable object. In this case, it's a lambda. And there, are, there also is a call operation at the end of the static if. And this is what allows <coughs> the branches to compile and only be instantiated if the matching branch is taken. Sure, question. Now, let's say we have a liquid which you can drink because it doesn't have an interface with that compile. So the question is, let's say that we have a liquid that you cannot drink because there is no drink method in the liquid. That uh, would throw a compiler error because if we define it liquid uh, true with a type that doesn't have drink, this will evaluate to true, this branch will be taken, parsed and instantiated, and so it will result in a compile time error. The point of the example, uh, the categorizing into liquid and solid should be correct. I mean, the developer shouldn't mark something that, has the drink, that doesn't have the drink method as liquid. So um, let's try to analyze this, um, this, this example a little more. First thing you notice is the bool v so what's the bool v for? So wrapping values inside types is what allows amazing libraries such as Boostana and FeatureTick by Paul Fultz to provide extremely powerful, clean, and intuitive metaprogramming facilities, in my opinion. And this paradigm is basically taking um, a compile time value and put it into, sorry, a compile time variable, put it in, into a value so that you can pass it around like if it was uh, a normal value. And you can learn more about type value encoding, also called dependent typing at these links. Uh, now for the scope rules, they are what you expect because we are opening the braces here, opening closing braces here. So we have no crazy stuff with the scopes. And you can think of every branch of the static if as a template function that will be only instantiated if the predicate matches. That's the trick that we're using. So. This is possible thanks to C14's generic lambdas. As an example, take the first branch of the construct. We have this uh, forwarding reference here called y and some actions inside of the lambda. And the lambda will roughly be equivalent to the following struct after compilation. So we will have an anonymous type here, a templatized operator call with t, where t is our argument. It will be const by default. And inside the, this operator call, we'll have our actions. So what allows static if to only instantiate the branches that match the condition? The trick is that we're going to pass the argument back to static if with the final call operator in order to delay the instantiation of the branches after we have evaluated the compile time condition. So in this small uh, example, this x here will be passed inside the lambda, one of the two lambdas, depending on the condition. And this allows Sphenae to take place in order to instantiate only the branch that uh, matches the condition. So imagine if this bool v here evaluated to true, then this x here will be passed ins inside the then branch and take place of the y variable. The other branch will never be instantiated, but it has to be parsable. Is that clear to everyone? Okay. Uh, so we could like uh, capture x by reference or by value, but if we capture x and we don't have any kind of um, generic lambda here, it will be immediately instantiated by the compiler even if the condition is not true. So that's why we need to defer the instantiation by passing the value later and have it uh, forwarded to the correct lambda depending on the predicate. So if we now try to consume various types of foods and numbers, we will, see, we will see that the output is what we expect. Oops. 
as you can see, we get the branching at compile time and we get the expected output. In the next code segment, we'll implement static key from, from scratch. So I'll begin by defining some utility macros analysis. The first one is my forward macro, which is a simple wrapper for a std forward that avoids the unnecessary repetition of the types and the name of the values. This is mostly useful when you're dealing with uh, generic lambdas, as otherwise you would have to say decal type of the name of the argument and then the name of the argument again. It's just a macro to avoid repetition. Then this is how I store Boolean values, template, sorry, compile time Boolean values inside actual values. And I do that by using a std integral constant. To instantiate them, I use the bool v variable template, which avoids the initialization syntax and makes it a little nicer to work with. You should know that C17 will introduce bool constant, so there will be no need of saying a std integral constant of bool. So let's talk about my sources. My static implementation was inspired primarily by this article written by Bast ba Bapti Baptized Witch, sorry if the pronunciation is incorrect, and the comment on its Reddit thread. Also, uh, I believe it was Paul Fools II that uh, wrote the then else chaining inside this CPP core guidelines issue that actually wanted to add a version of static if to the CPP core guidelines. It got rejected because context if is coming, so that's why it got rejected. So the implementation of static if is composed by several elements. We have an interface function that is called static if, where we pass a compile time Boolean value. It will return an helper static if input struct that will allow the then and else chaining and eventually return a result struct as soon as we find the matching predicate. The result struct will ignore the other chaining calls and execute the, ma the matched branch. This is the signature of the static if. We just, pass a, we just deduce the type of the predicate and pass it as a value. And it will return our static if implementation here. The static if implementation will take a Boolean param template parameter, which will be the predicate evaluated. So this will be the result of the predicate. And inside the struct, we will have all the methods that allow us to chain the then and else um, branches. Finally, when we'll find a matching branch inside the static if sample, we'll return a static if result struct that will, uh, we will we'll have the branch, the matching branch lambda as its type name. And it will derive from this function so that we can actually call it and execute the matching branch. So to reiterate, static if sample will be returned by the static if interface. And every instance of this struct here represents a branch. The type will be specialized depending on whether or not the predicate is matched. So if the predicate is true or false. Static if result will ignore subsequent chaining methods like then or else and will inherit from the branch lambda in order to be callable. If static if impl evaluates to true, then this result will only be returned as soon as we find that then branch. If static if impl evaluates to false, then we will return a result only when we find an else branch. We'll also have some helper functions to create the result. And now let's see the implementation with the explicit specialization. So this is static if impl. Remember, it's, it is returned by the interface function. And this is the true specialization. So this is what is going to be returned when the predicate is true. In, we don't care about the else statements because the predicate is true. So what we're doing is we're looking for the 10 statement. So we ignore else, we ignore else if, and as soon as we find then, we know that since we, the predicate was true, this is what we're looking for, and we can return a result by forwarding the branch lambda inside the result struct. Is that clear? Sir, question. Uh, the question was, would it make any sense to make this function constexpr? Yes, it would. In my actual implementation, I do have them constexpr. The, uh, the problem is that if you use lambdas as branches, is, it doesn't really work until 17, as you cannot have constexpr lambdas. But if you use callables, I actually do that in one, one piece of code. Uh, you can use static if as a 
uh, with a context result, so it's okay. So for the false specialization, what we're going to do is we're going to ignore the then because the predicate is false, so we don't wa want to match the then branch. And we're going to first check if we have an else branch here, and if we do, we immediately return the result as we know that the predicate is false. If we have an else if branch, we will call static if again with the new predicate and return a new static if instance. There is a situation where you might have a static if without an else branch, so it's just static if predicate and then. In the case that the predicate is false, we need to ignore any possible call to the static if. So this is why we have this dummy operator here that will ignore any kind of calls onto a failed matching. The last piece we need to complete the implementation is static if result. And what we do is get the branch, which is usually a lambda, and derive from it so that we automatically can call the result. Since the result could be returned in the middle of the chain, we need to ignore any other calls to the chain. So if we, there is any, any then, any LC for else, we just return this to ignore them. And these are the implementations of the helper functions. Here we just use this make static if result to deduce the type and forward the lambda inside the instance. And here we do the same with the predicate. We just deduce the type of the predicate and evaluate ins it inside the static if impl. Is everything clear? OK, nice. So let's see some additional examples. This is something I've encountered while writing a res generic resizable buffer. And I had to deal with move constructors. And as you can see here, I have a static if inside of a for loop. And I check if the type t is move constructible. And depending on or whether or not it is constructible by an std move, I call either this branch or either this one. And it's, I think it's much nicer than explicit specialization. Because otherwise, I would have to specialize some kind of helper struct or function, have it outside of this method. And if I, were, were, I've, if I had to maintain the code, I would have to check that specialization. With static if, everything is, is in the same place, and it's very local and easy to reason about. As you can see here, I have to pass all data as a parameter to the lambdas, because otherwise, this might not compile if it were, was not move constructible. Another example, a little more complex, a little more complex one, is where I was implementing a left fold using recursion. And I was implementing it using lambdas. And to use recursion in lambdas, you have to pass the lambda itself as its first parameter. And to stop the recursion, I actually use static if here. I check if the remaining parameter pack has some values. If so, I jump to the recursive case. Otherwise, I just return the current accumulation value. So as you can see, it's very easy to reason about thanks to its locality. Now we are done with static if. I hope it is clear to everyone. The next part of the talk will revolve around uh, iteration and compile time. Any question? When you create your static if, all the conditions will have to be evaluated, right? So the question is, when you create your static if chain, all the conditions will have to be evaluated. Um, let me think about it. I think they will all be evaluated like immediately because you have to specialize the structs with the result of the evaluation. So there is no. Um, you are not deferring the evaluation of the predicate to a later step. If you want to do that, you need to nest one static if inside the other and use this finite trick with the lambdas to delay the evaluation of the predicate to a later step. So the second part of the talk will revolve around compile time iteration. One good starting point, in my opinion, is the famous for each argument snippet originally posted on Twitter by Sean Parent. I've analyzed the TCP Picon 2015, and this is like, uh, a link to my talk where I explain how it works in depth, and I expand it with some additional features. But I hope you're familiar with the snippet. If not, this is a quick ex explanation. So for args takes a callable object as the first parameter, and a variadic number of objects as 
its rest of parameters. And it will use a trick here with initializer list that we showed yesterday, where we provide a context in which variadic expansion can take place. And we make use of that context to expand this function call here by forwarding every single parameter and using the comma operator to have it evaluate to an int so that it can actually compile inside the initializer list of int. So if this is not clear, the following for args call, where we have a lambda here that will print everything to a CD out, roughly expands to something like this. You have the initializer list, and every single element of the initializer list is enclosed in round parentheses, where the first, the first argument before the comma operator is a function call to the lambda we passed with the argument, the current argument in the variadic list. Then we have the comma operator here that will allow all of this to uh, evaluate to an int. And then we have the comma operator, the comma here that builds up the initializer list of ints. So this is valid at compilation time because every single element evaluates to int. <coughs> and it guarantees that every function call is, uh, is evaluated left from left to right and also uh, respects side effects. So you can use it to generate code. In turn, all of this is the same as writing this. So we just generated some code at compile time to write some values to std out. So as an example, in our main, we have this, the, same, the same code where we print out something with this lambda, and we pass a number of arguments here. If we compile it, you can see that we get the expected result, which is hello123. In C++ 17, we have something called fold expressions that will allow us to implement this forex function in a much more clean and straightforward way. And since fold expressions work on specific operators, what we do is have a list of operators that are supported by fold expressions, and the home operator is one of them. So we are folding this function call here, a left fold, uh, using the ellipsis operator and closing round parentheses, and this will produce the thing that we produce with the static, uh, sorry, with the initializer list trick uh, at compile time. So this will expand our compile time and generate some code. This is valid C++ 17, but it's not possible to do this in C++ 14. If you want to learn more about fold expressions, just go on CPP reference, it's very well explained. Sure? I'm wondering why, why is the order of evaluation uh, in the fold expression case? So the question is, why is the order evaluation required to be from left to right when using a fold expression? That's a good question. Uh, I remember checking it, out, checking it out when writing the, the code here. I think it's mandated by the standard that it has to be evaluated left to right. If anyone can clarify, but I think that's the reason. We can actually check it out later, maybe on CPP reference. So, this is an example of something I've actually encountered during my, uh, in my code base. So let's say that you have a template class buffer that takes a number of bytes as its template parameter and does some kind of allocation and deallocation here. We'd like to run some tests with various amount of bytes in a very straightforward way. So imagine if we had a runtime buffer class where we could pass the number of bytes to the constructor. It's very easy to write the test because we just iterate over this initializer list of values here, we, and we pass n to the constructor. We do our allocation, we perform the test, and we deallocate. So as you can see, it's extremely easy when we have the runtime tests. If we want to do this at compile time, because remember, this, our buffer class is templatized over the number of bytes, it's not as easy. We would have either to use recursion or to use a metaprogramming library. But if we use type value encoding and we'll encode the, um, the size t value inside an SZ v value that we can pass as a normal runtime value but will actually be readable at compile time, we have a way of passing arbitrarily, uh, arbitrary values in a compile time list. So to clarify what I mean, is that we can use for args 
with our lambda here that we'll allocate the buffer using the end parameter as a template parameter and do our tests. And since we need to maintain the information about the number at compile time, we have to create these wrappers here that will wrap the number into an STD integral constant, which will maintain that information about the value during the iteration at compile time. So this for args here will generate code to allocate a buffer, perform a test at the allocate with every single number you see down here. Is it clear why we need to wrap the, the numbers inside integral constant? So this kind of way of programming is very powerful because as you can see, it's not much different from the runtime version. It has just a little more boilerplate noise, but these are just regular values. We're passing them inside a lambda, and we're using these values at compile time to do our testing. So it's very easy to read, very straightforward, and I prefer it, obviously, to recursion and any other traditional method. If you want to uh, make it uh, even nicer, you could create some additional abstraction, like a four values uh, template function, where you specify the type of the value and post all the values as a template parameter pack. And these will create the values, pass them into four args, and do this. But it's just an additional abstraction. In the next code segment, we'll see how well static if and for args work together. So in this code segment, we'll implement a simple example that shows how the two constructs work well together. Something we often want to do is iterate over types or manipulate types directly. And we need to find a way to pass types as values. So again, this is where the wrapping comes into play, the type value encoding paradigm com comes into play. We define this struct type here that takes a parameter t and defines this, this type alias inside. And we create a context variable that is templatized over t and is called type. So now we can instantiate these values here, type t, which behave like integral constants for types. So we can wrap types inside values and pass them around to functions. This is the primary, primary concept between, behind Boost HANA and other libraries, modern libraries. To get uh, the type out of the value, we can use this unwrap alias here that will look into the type of the wrapper and basically return the, the store type inside. So combining uh, a type wrapper and four args is very powerful when we want to instantiate various types and execute a test function with them. Let's say that we have a tuple of several type of buffers, vector of int, vector of float, and vector of double. And we need to write a function that will resize all buffers to a, new, to a specific size. So we could do it with recursion, we could do it with variadic expansion, but this is the way I'd like to do it. It's a very straightforward for each function where we pass the types as tags here, wrap types, and inside the lambda function, we take the type, we unwrap it, we get the corresponding vector type, and then we call a cd get onto the buffer uh, tuple and resize it with the new sides. So what I'm striving for is some kind of syntax that is very close to the imperative for each syntax and the imperative if syntax, but works at compile time. This is what I mean with static control flow. It's the old familiar idea of iterating over a list of values, but this is done at compile time and it's actually generating code. So when we call resides all buffers, basically three, three instantiation of this lambda will happen and we will generate code at compile time for the int, float, and double vectors. This is even more powerful when we combine it with static if. Let's have another contrived example where we have a function to initialize a small object storage and a function to initialize a big object storage. And we want to branch over the size of a type in a list of types and initialize the correct object storage. So we can wrap int, float, double, and an array of double into the type wrapper values. We pass those two for args and every single value is going to get into the lambda here. We're going to get the real type from the wrapper 
do some checks on the sides of the type, and then we can either initialize the small object storage and the big object storage. So again, this is very similar to what you would do imperatively at runtime, but it also happens at compile time. Uh, note that we don't have to use this finite trick here because the, the function call does not depend on the type of the object as the functions that I shown earlier uh, take another parameter. So it will always be instantiated. It can always be instantiated. It doesn't depend on the type of the object. So iterating over a compile time collection using for args is quite powerful and probably good enough for most of what you have to do. But it has some annoying limitations. Like it is not possible to get the current iteration index. It would be possible if instead of passing types or values, we would pass pairs that contain the current index and the value we want to pass. But that's obviously very annoying. It is not possible to produce a result value. And we have no equivalent of break and continue. And since one of my goals is staying true to the imperative runtime for each and if constructs, I'd like to have a break and continue at compile time. Let's see how we can implement a compile time for each loop in the next code segment using C++14 features. Any questions so far? <coughs> so I'll call this implementation static4. And compar compared to the four args, I will add the following features. There will be a possibility to access the current iteration index which will be a compile time number, the possibility to produce an output value using accumulation, and an intuitive break and an intuitive continue construct so that you can think in terms of a, a runtime for loop. Before diving into its implementation, let's take a look at an example that it's pretty contrived, but it shows every single feature at once. So we will write a static for loop that will accept any number of compile time numerical values, it will accumulate the numbers and return the result at compile time. It will print every even number and iteration. And it will immediately break when minus 999 is encountered. So these are artificial rules that I'm using just to demonstrate every, every single feature of the loop. So static4 works by passing its current state as a parameter to the loop body for every iteration. So the state here that you see in the lambda that we're going to pass to static4 is generated by the static4 itself and it contains metadata about the current iteration and the current accumulation value. The x parameter is our current value that we're iterating over. So the state contains the current iteration as a compile time number, the next action to execute because we need to know if we have to break or continue looping, and an accumulator variable that can be used for compile time computations. Calling static4 with a loop body does not immediately start the execution. You actually get back a new function where you can bind an initial accumulation value. And after you, can do, after you do that, you will get another function that you can call with a variadic number of arguments in order to start the execution. This is to promote usability of the static4. Maybe you want the same loop body, but you want different accumulation values. So it's, it's easier this way. You can think about it. Uh, like carrying in a fu functional programming language. Sure. Uh, is this like on the end? If, if you think this a little bit farther, could you have something like a uh, compile time coroutine? That's interesting. So the question is, if you bring this a little farther, would you be able to add a compile time coroutine? So I never thought about it. Uh, I don't think we can have some some kind of compile time coroutine. It's interesting to think about it. Uh, I'm not sure how you would be able to pause and then resume the, the state. It's interesting though. So let's analyze the body of the for loop. GCC obviously does not like when state and x are used inside constant expressions. So we need to reinstantiate them as context variables. Clang accepts the the variables in their current state, but GCC doesn't like, doesn't like that. To be honest, I didn't try GCC 6, so this is 5.3. And what we do is simply reinstantiate the state 
and the current parameter using decal type and the initialization syntax so that, so that we get the context variable. Uh, for readability, I assign a name to the predicates. We must break when x is this magic value here, and we, was, we must print something when x is, is even. So as you can see, I'm forcing the predicate to be evaluated at the compile time by wrapping it inside a bool v context value. Then inside the, the, the body of the static for, we have a static if that checks if we, if we have to break. And if so, then we use state dot break underscore to prevent further iteration from happening. This is obviously not as clean as a break inside a for loop, but it, I think it's the closest you can get uh, to an imperative break at compile time unless you want to use macros. Otherwise, if we don't have to break, we have another static if here that checks if the number is even. And if so, we print the iteration and the even number as specified by the rules. If we want to continue looping and eventually uh, accumulate some kind of value, we can use state.continue. And if we pass no arguments, we will keep the current accumulation value. Otherwise, we can pass an argument that will replace the accumulation value in the next iteration. And this is how you can accumulate values and perform compile time computations using uh, an imperative syntax. So notice that I use SCZV here to force the value to be a compile time wrapped value. Now, uh, I also, I've also written a runtime version of the loop just to see the differences. And as you can see, it maps quite nicely to our compile time version. We have the four here. That is, this will be our parameter pack. This is our x in the lambda. And uh, the, every if call can be replaced by a static if. Break can be replaced by state break. And we don't have an explicit continue here, but we could do some kind of introspection to see if we're returning void and implicitly continue. But just imagine that at the end of the brace here, we're just calling state.continue. The accumulator is defined uh, outside of the loop body and captured by a lambda so that we can have that kind of carring style of computation. And at the end of the for loop, we return the accumulator. So this is how our loop would look like if we were, were doing it at runtime. Let's clarify what happens when we call static for. When we call static for with body, a wrapper for body is returned that we can can, that can be called again two times. The second time we call the static for, we bind an initial accumulation value to the body of the for. And the third time we call it with a variadic argument pack, we start the execution uh, using the body and the initial accumulation value that we bound in the previous calls. This is done just to uh, allow the user to uh, bind different accumulation values without having to specify the body again. So as an example, here we create an alias of the print even and accumulate loop by binding zero as our initial accumulation value. And then we execute the loop, passing some arguments here, which is 5, 4, 15, and 35. We'll also execute the runtime loop and just check for equality and see if there is any difference in the break and continue computations. So if we compile this piece of code, we will get the expected output, both at compile time and runtime, which is produced by accumulating. The only even number in the list is four, so that's when we're going to get the iteration, the iteration printed and the current value. And since both results are the same, we get okay. So as you can see, the syntax is not as nice as a runtime loop, but it maps quite one-to-one -one with the uh, runtime constructs, and we get the same, va the same behavior, just that one behavior is around time and the other one is a compile time. Uh, another thing I want to mention is that obviously the compile time loop can have side effects. So you can use it not only to compute compile time values, but also to generate code. In this case, we generated a call to STDC out. Sure. So uh, how many instructions does the compile time version 
The question is how many instructions is the compile time version? Do you mean uh, like if? Okay, I have I have a, a segment on that later. So the question was assembly instructions. Does is there any overhead if we compile static four in terms of as of assembly? I have a, a code segment later that will show exactly that. <sighs> Let's implement static four. So I'm including static if because we need that in implementation. And let's start by thinking about what we require to implement static for. We need some kind of state class that keeps track of the iteration of the accumulator and the next action. And this state class must keep track of this, of this stuff at compile time. So we will track the iteration using an integral constant. The accumulator will be provided by the user code. And the next action will be implemented using two empty tag structs because we need to branch at compile time depending on whether or not we have to break or continue the iteration. We also need to iterate at compile time, and this can be implemented using recursion. Now, after seeing Luis talk yesterday, I'm convinced that there, must, there could be a better way of doing this with some kind of parameter expansion or using constexpr, so I don't know. Sure. Because this is actually, this is basically a fold, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's any way to do it in recursion. Okay. So the comment was that since it's, this is actually a glorified version of a left fold, there is probably no way of doing that with a recursion. Okay. You crushed my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how we'll, we'll be implementing the action classes, which are just tags to uh, branch upon during the iteration. And I just use a namespace here for readability and two empty structs, a continuous struct and a break struct. If you're wondering why I'm using the underscore in the user code and a underscore here is because continue and break are keywords and it won't let me use them without any kind of uh, other character attached to them. Now let's implement the state class. So the source state has to be accessible at compile time. Therefore, I'll, I'll use both templates to sort the values and constructs to provide a nice interface to the user. The state struct has to store the current iteration, the current accumulator, and the next action to perform. I could store the iteration as a std size t parameter, but I'm striving to use type value encoding where possible as it is much nicer to work with. So I will just use uh, an integral constant as my iteration value here. These are the methods that the user can call to query the state of the, of the iteration and the accumulation. The next action will be used by the implementation. Uh, ideally, this would be in private and non-public. And we have to provide the user some ways of continuing the iteration changing the accumulation value or breaking out of the loop. So what I decide to do is to have uh, an overload for continue and an overload for break that will take a new accumulation value and replace the current accumulation value in the next iteration, or a zero parameter overload that will keep the current accumulation value and just pass it up to the next iteration. And everything is constexpr, so it, it can be evaluated nicely at compile time. To simplify the management of the state, I defined some helper functions that are type value encoding friendly so that we can pass the iteration value, the accumulation and the action as uh, value parameters here. And this allows us to deduce the type very nicely so that we don't have to specify the type of the parameters explicitly. So this will just create a state and return it. And this other function called advanced state will take a state S, a new accumulation value A, and a new action NA, and will return a new state incrementing the previous state's iteration, wrapping it inside a compile time value, and passing through the accumulation and the next action. So what this does is just make a state with an incremented iteration counter depending on the previous state. We can now provide a definition for those methods. Uh, we'll start with the uh, new accumulation overload here. And what continue will do is simply advance the current state, which we can get with this, 
passing the new accumulation value and instantiating a continue tag gear just to inform the iteration that the sorry the implementation that the iteration has to continue. In the case of the zero parameter overload, we'll just call the other continue passing the current accumulation value because we don't want to replace it. And this is exactly the same thing for break, only that instead of passing continue here, we pass the break tag. And this will be recognized by the uh, recursion in order to stop iterating over the values. The last and most complex part to implement is the static for function, which will deal with iteration and accumulation. The interface of the static for function, which will remember return just a wrapper to the body, uh, takes a callable object here, which is usually a lambda, and it takes it by forwarding reference, and it, for it is forwarded in a generic capture list inside a, type, a step lambda here. So the idea here is that we're using recursion using uh, lambdas, and we want to recurse onto step itself. Since it is not possible to refer to the current lambda uh, with the same name inside of the lambda body itself, we need to pass step to itself as a parameter in order to be able to record with it. The other parameters of the lambda are the state, which will be the current state of the iteration, the, the for each argument that we're going to evaluate, and the rest of the arguments. So the first thing we do inside the step lambda, and remember, the step lambda is what is going, we are going to recurse upon, is calculate the next state by calling the body function, which is the user provider lambda, with the current state and the x argument. Then we'll check if this is actually the last iteration of the loop, and that, that is true when there are no more parameters to, uh, to evaluate. And now we need to check if we have to break, but we need to check if, the, if break is going to be returned in the next state, not the current state, otherwise we'll have one extra iteration. So to do that, we use decal type on the next state's action, and if the next state uh, would return break, in that case we must immediately break to prevent the next iteration from, from occurring. And I do this in the predicate, bool v predicate, using std saying to check if the next state would return a break action. Now it's time to deal with the recursion. And this is where static if comes in handy. So uh, here it's quite straightforward. If we have to break, or if this is the last iteration, then we'll just return the current accumulation value. Otherwise, we will call ourselves, with ourselves again as the first parameter, the new state and excess. Remember that this self here is the lambda step, which is passed to itself as one of the parameters in order to allow recursion. Uh, I have to pass self here and do this finite trick inside static if because um, this parameter pack may be empty, so this call could, not, could be not valid if we have to break or if the last iteration is, or if the current is iteration is actually the last iteration. So this has to be instantiated only when we are sure that we have some parameters in the last parameter pack. Now remember, we are inside the first static for call, so what we want to do is uh, wrap the lambda body and give back to the user something that can be used to bound the initial accumulation value. And to do so, we move the step inside this other lambda that will be returned by the static for function, which will take an accumulation value. It will store both the step and the accumulator by capturing them by value, and return another function that will take a variadic amount of arguments, and those are the arguments that will actually fire off the recursion and evaluate the values at compile time. And this is a form of carrying as, uh, explicitly implemented using nested lambda returns. Now we need to explicitly check if we are starting the iteration with an empty parameter pack, because otherwise we'll, it will not compile. And if we're doing so, we just immediately return the accumulation value. Otherwise, we forward our arguments and the step to the else lambda here. We create an initial state 
which starts from iteration zero, the initial accumulation value, and by default, we want to continue. And finally, we can call step with itself at the first argument, the initial state, and forwarding all the variadic arguments. And that's it. So if we want to test our implementation, here is a simple uh, example where we have a static for that uh, will print the iteration, the current value, the accumulator. And here, what I'm going to compute is the sum of the previous value plus the current value. So I'm going to just fold and accumulate the numbers. And I will always return continue with the new accumulator value. So what, is it, what this is going to do is start from zero, accumulate all, those, all these values together by summing, and we'll print every iteration value accumulation to the console. So this is generating code, and this accumulation is, is being done at compile time. So if we want to um, use the result of the accumulation in a template, we can, because the result here is uh, an integral constant, and we can use it, use it in, in compile time context. Let's start the, the code segment and see the output. So this is the output, and this is generated by the static four. As you can see, we have every iteration here, and the current values. And while we iterate, we accumulate the values at, at compile time. And in the end, we have the result right here, which is stored inside an integral constant. So that's pretty much it for the static four. Any question about the implementation? Okay, so the thing that we're doing with the lambda to recurs is not very elegant because we have to repeat self two times and pass the lambda to itself. So we can use something for functional programming that's called a Y combinator to deal with number rec recursion and avoid this kind of repetition here. So this is our current solution. To recurse inside a lambda, we have to pass the lambda itself as one of its parameters. And we want to avoid that. And turns out there is a very commonly well-known uh, combinator that's called the Y combinator that in practice allows to implement recursion in lambda calculus and to implement recursion in C++ lambdas and functional programming languages that do not re natively support lambda recursion. Let's look at a very basic example. So this is a factorial implementation using lambdas. And as you can see, since I want to recurse over the factorial lambda itself, I am not able to say factorial impl here because it the compiler will not allow me to do that. So I have to pass this self parameter here, which will be the factorial imp itself, multiple times in order to perform the recursion. So what I do for clarity is define an interface function that will return factorial imp of factorial imp of x. And this fires off, fires off the recursion. With a y combinator, what we can do is still have a self-parameter here because that's required since we cannot refer to the original lambda, but we can avoid the repetition of the self-parameter here. And instead of creating a manual interface function, we can just invoke the Y combinator over the implementation function and we will get um, a nicer function as a result that will deal with the passing self in, like, in the implementation details. So the user does not have to know about this kind of recursion implementation te technique in lambdas. The Y combinator is very easy to implement in C++14 because we can store the function inside an helper, an helper struct. In this case, I have uh, an implementation class called Y combinator result that will be returned by an interface function. And what this does is take our lambda here, store it, and all the magic happens in the operator call here that will call the original function, passing a reference to this Y combinator as the first parameter and forwarding the arguments. So it's quite hard to think about it, but what happens is that the self parameter is always the Y combinator. And since the Y combinator overloads the operator call, it is not necessary to pass the self over and over because the Y combinator will deal with it in this piece of code here. <coughs> 
Any question about that? So the last thing we need is a Y Combinator interface function that will take a callable object and it will de um, compute the decay type in order to store the object inside the Y Combinator and forward the callable object inside the instance. And that's what will re return to the user. This is how it works in practice. So again, we have our factorial method here, which takes itself an X and returns an int. And we can just return self here without having to specify self again. The Y Combinator will take care of, uh, of that for us. And to create the interface function, we just invoke the Y Combinator, and the result of this call will be a Y Combinator result that will deal with the lambda recursion. So in this case, we have factorial of five, and you can imagine something like this happening. So the call factorial five evaluates to the Y Combinator factorial impl of five multiplied by the Y Combinator factorial impl of four, and this kind of recursion here will allow factorial impl to be passed as the first parameter over and over. So that's what the Y Combinator does. Now we have this nice abstraction over lambda recursion, and we can use it in our uh, static for implementation. The only changes are here. We don't have to specify itself two times. So we can just call itself, which is the step function, only once. And here, instead of returning x step of x step, we just return the y combinator of x step, and that will take care of the recursion for us. So this is the complete implementation of a static four. It is not perfect. There are some additional future improvements that we could implement. So something I like to see is generic clarity, like taking arguments n by n without having to store them inside pairs or tuples which could be useful in some situation to improve the syntax. Also, I'd like to detect a missing return and continue by default so that we don't have to specify state continue if we just want to generate code by iterating over some values. This is quite easy to do. We just use decal type and check if the current iteration would return void. And in that case, we continue by default. And Again, to improve the syntax, we could have an overload without any initial accumulation value because sometimes what you want to do is just produce some, generate some code and not care about a final compile time result. So this is what, what's the difference between a static for and a fold. That the fold is a more functional approach which, uh, whose main uh, goal is to produce a result value, while the static for is both code generation and uh, also, you may need some kind of value during the generation, so that's the added flexibility. For the last code segment, I, so that I can answer your question, we are actually going to look at the assembly produced via traditional code, traditional code like uh, hand unrolled code and the static for code. And the results are quite nice because GCC 5.3 produces the identical assembly from uh, optimization one onwards, and Clang 3.7.1 produces the identical assembly from O2 onwards. So you can think of static if and static for as cost-free abstractions given uh, a big enough optimi optimization level. I'll show you the, the test files, which are very simple. So in the static for version, I use here some volatile uh, int to uh, prevent the compiler from optimizing them out. And I have this kind of uh, iteration here, where I loops over some values and do some stuff just to prevent uh, the compiler to remove re from removing everything. And the traditional uh, test is just the same thing, but written by hand. And I used a diff to check the differences in assembly. And when we have this uh, optimization level, there is no difference. So you don't pay in terms of code bloat and obviously in terms of memory or runtime overhead. There is no, no overhead. The only overhead I can think of is compilation time, but I didn't benchmark it. Uh, now that we have MetaBench, I could try that. <laughs> so if you, it, there are some very powerful existing production-ready solutions. I hope you're all familiar with Boost Hena, and there, this is an, uh, just a mapping of what I did to Boost Hena because there are m much po more powerful functional-oriented ways of achieving the same results. But in Bustena, you can find something similar to static if in evil if. Uh, 
where we have this kind of predicate and we still have the lambda here in order to defer the execution depending on the result of the predicate. Is that correct, Louis? Yeah. Okay. So the underscore, the, well, so the underscore is just because uh, it is what you refer to as this finite rate. Okay, perfect. So the it comment. actually an identity function. It returns its argument unchanged, but it, it prevents the compiler from instantiating the branch too fast. Okay, perfect. So the comment is that this underscore parameter you see here is what I'm doing with this finite trick in my static if, and it is actually the identity function, so there is no need to specify the parameter again, basically, right? Um, to pass it back to evil if. No, what I'm, what, well, what I said is just that the underscore is an identity function. Eval if will call your lambda, your branch, using an identity function, which means that when you do underscore parens and parens, you're actually just saying m, except the compiler cannot know that until it, you know, effectively okay. instantiates the branch. So, so it allows this is what gets deferred, right? To a later step, yeah. okay. So everything that's called with uh, underscore is deferred basically. Okay. So the comment is that everything that's called with the underscore, which is an identity function, is deferred to a later step in the compilation. Also with uh, the static for, we can find for each here. That's another way of generating code. And the first argument is a tuple of heterogeneous values. And the second argument is a function that will be executed for every single value inside the tuple. Also in Paul Fultz the second's fit modern function utility library, we have some similar functionality to static if. And it's a little different here. We have an evil uh, outer function here that will delay the execution of the inner arguments. And we can implement static if using conditional and passing the, this if adapter here that will uh, do this finite trick with the lambda that's passed after the predicate here. So the syntax is a little different, but conceptually it is the same thing as static if. It's just delaying the execution of this thing here using evil and waiting to see if the predicate is true or false. And using fit, compress and apply, we can create something similar to static for. So Basically, by combining these two utilities and a body, which is usually a lambda, and a variadic number of parameters, we get something equivalent to the body called multiple times over the parameters. So this is a way of, if, like, you have to obviously to handle the recursion inside the body, but this can be used to implement static for. So there are some production-ready implementations that you can use in your code, or just uh, grab the code from my GitHub page or implement your own. Uh, that's pretty much it. I have a question. Could you comment on std apply for C++17? Isn't it also very similar? Okay, I have another code segment for that. So the, the, the question was, can you comment on std apply? Isn't it similar to, uh, I think, this piece of code here? Yeah, it is similar. And I have this extra code segment here where I show you how you can store these compile time values into lists that you can pass around those values and perform operation over the list elements. So the way I do it is, uh, I'll start by saying that I'm including experimental tuple because I need apply. And I make tuples of these empty compile time values. And I think of a steady tuple as a compile time list data structure. And to make it easier to reason about, I create a wrapper for reliability that I stored inside these namespaces here. And I have a function make that takes a number of parameters and just creates a tuple. And as you can see here, I create a list of compile time values by invoking the make function with a variadic amount of parameters. And this is an empty tuple of compile time tags. And I can pass this tuple around as a normal value. And if I want to iterate over every single value inside the tuple, what I can do is use for args, binding my body using a lambda which accepts uh, a variety amount of uh, parameters. And using std experimental apply over this function here that I have that adapted and forwarding the tuple in order to expand the tuple contents inside the adapted function. And this is pretty much equivalent to iterating over every single element of the tuple. Since the tuple is storing type value encoding compile time elements, this is a way of dealing with compile time lists and performing computations on them. So I hope that answers your question. So that's it. We are a little, uh, we finished a little early. So if you have any questions or feedback,
I'll be happy to hear it. Sure. Can you go back to the eat drinking example? Sure. Uh, should be here, okay? Which part? Uh, yeah, that's that's fine. I mean, uh, is it allowed to use multiple as if branches? Multiple what? Sorry. I mean that that I use an as if and then another as if. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is allowed because uh, if the, pre the sorry, the question is, is it allowed to use multiple else if and then branches? Yes. And the answer is yes because if this predicate is false, uh, we won't we won't go into the then branch. We'll just skip it and keep going uh, over the other methods. So if this is if this is doesn't match, like we just skip it and keep going. I can show you why in the implementation. Um, so. So basically, the question is that it's not a it's not a problem if if you have a a, a, a parameter for the as if which uh, fits for the next as if too. No, it's not a problem. You can do that. Okay, so you, you can. Yes. Because otherwise, in Spina, it's it's not easy to. Okay. There. The sequence, you know, the, the conditions. Yes. So there is something you have to be careful about. Because if, if one of the conditions in the chain depends on a previous condition, it, uh, on a previous branch, you might want to nest static ifs one into each other to allow Sphenae to take place multiple times. So it, de it, de exactly. okay, it depends on the predicate. I, I, ju I just wonder that whether this is a bit, bit more similar for me than static switch. Okay, so the comment is, what if you want some kind of a static switch? Uh, I don't think that a static switch requires multiple Sphina calls because you're expecting like a single value and testing predicate over that value over and over. So it doesn't depend on the previous predicate. So I think you can Im probably implement an interface function that generates a static if with an else if then, else if then chain and get your static switch. So you don't need any additional Sphina tricks is just a static if with multiple else if then branches. Sure. Why does dot then exist? It can only happen after a static if or an else if, right? Yeah. So why does dot then exist? Uh, can its argument just be folded into the if? Yeah. I, I guess it exists just as a s some, this is the syntax that was introduced in the CPP core guidelines issue, and I liked it and just re-implemented it. Uh, I'm sure you could have the lambda as an extra parameter here, but I think it looks cleaner if you have this kind of chaining gear with dot then. It's just personal preference. I'm sure you could implement it what with. What happens if you omitted that? Right now? Yeah, what if you just took out that dot then block and just uh, static guess if the else if? So like this? Yeah. Interesting question. I, I haven't thought about it. I, I'm assuming that the user is always having a, a then before an else if. So you could do some compile time checks to prevent this from happening. Right now it's not happening, so we can try compiling it. And yeah, we get some errors here. So it's probably instantiating the wrong branch. It's it isn't supposed to happen. I'm always assuming that the user is correctly writing then else chains without this kind of weird chaining. Sure. Uh, what happens if you duplicate the else part with them? Uh, will will both else branches be instantiated, even though only the first will be called? Okay. So the question is, what happens if you duplicate the else branches? No, the else. Oh, the else if branches? Yeah, you duplicate the code exactly as it is. Will it instantiate also the second piece of equipment? Yeah. That's right. Oops. Like this, right? Yeah. Okay. So it does compile. <laughs> um, no, it's 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 instantiating both lamb. I think it's instantiating. Um, only the first one, because as soon as you get to the predicate and it evaluates to false, 
Yeah. Uh, to, to Call y something that doesn't exist in the second one. Sure. Just, just change the dream. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> change the dream. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, it does compile. Okay. So, yeah. so as soon as you get a, an else if branch that's patching, it just instantiates that one. The others have to be parsable, but they will not be instantiated. Okay. Oops. Okay. Any other question or feedback? Okay, I think we're done. Thank you.